East Belfast has many layers of fascinating history. We know more about our hidden past thanks to Gordon McCoy, Education Officer with the Tourist Organisation. One of his great projects has been the Gaelic Bus Tour of East Belfast, a movable feast of learning and storytelling. This bus tour was halted by the pandemic in 2020, but this has given us the chance to edit some documentary footage of Gordon in his element, delving into other worlds. Our journey starts in a tourist classroom in the Skianos building on the Newton Ards Road. Um, someone said to me, um, it's great to see that you're importing this culture, this Irish culture, Gordon, into East Belfast. And I started thinking, is there anything about the Irish culture in East Belfast that's here already? And I started off with the place names and the townland when I discovered to my shock that I lived in Ballymaconachie. Uh, I live on the Craigor Road. So I, I started off with Townland and I worked my way up to creating a whole um, history of East Belfast from all the scattered fragments, which has turned into a bus tour. My work is trying to indigenize the Irish language in East Belfast to make it part of the culture and to make our work um, be in tandem with the Conswater development, with the local heritage development of the area and with tourism in the area, so that although it's unusual, a Gaelic history in East Belfast, it's part of something bigger as well and that we're giving something back to the East. The Red Hand of Ulster is part of the local landscape, but the backstory is stranger than we might have imagined. So here we are in the uh, Old Ulster Bank on uh, Hollywood Arches and we have a symbol above us, Lao Jarag Erin, which is the Red Hand of Ireland. It's a simplified form of Lao Jarag Erin and uh, the Red Hand of Ireland, which was the symbol of the O'Neills of Ulster. Um, a symbol which they adopted from an earlier people, uh, a confederation of people called the Ullath. And one of the tribes of the Ullath were the McGuinnesses of uh, South Down. And the first poem to mention the Red Hand of Ireland, or the Red Hand of Ulster, is uh, attributed to them. It was written by a guy called Malachlan O'Higgin in the year 1426 or 1427 to praise the McGuinnesses. And says, um, it says, Lav Yaragerin Ivachach Rigru Go Run Kart Brahev Lekri Nalav Jeriga. So the Ivachach, that is the McGuinnesses, the Lords of Ivy, are the Red Hand of Ireland. And it goes on to describe how they never refused war and how they uh, battled without giving compensation. So in Irish law, you had to give compensation to someone if you hurt them or injured them. And if you killed someone, your hand was red until the debt was cleared. But these people of Ulster, uh, the McGuinnesses, were proud not to give compensation to the rest of Ireland, of with whom they waged war. So they were proud to be outlaws and have their hands red. Next stop is the Castlereagh Hills above the city and a site that connects us to an era that predates even the O'Neill dynasty. Okay, long before there were the O'Neills here, um, there was a tribe called the Dalfeidach and we believe that the, this is the, one of the first sites they built. Um, it's a network of um, forts called Lisnabrini and this is the most well-known one. And it is the first evidence of Irish speakers it built between 600 and 900. And they would have come to live here rather than into, this, into the Belfast city area because that would have been too swampy or too woody. And uh, there was much more cleared land, dry land up here. Um, the fort um, is banked up facing the north, the north break the wind. And it's south facing in a way, so it sort of catches all the sun and it would have been used to, um, there's a bit of a debate about this actually, to keep out um, animals who have been brought in at night and it would have been used to protect them from raiders or wolves. Another idea is that it was uh, a conferred status on the owner. Um, also crops would have been grown in the area outside and then the animals brought in 
uh, in the evening uh, and there would have been a, a dwelling here as well. Um, later in the 19th century they became sort of features of, of places so farmers would have put uh, put trees and hedgerows around them in the way you see today to make a sort of a feature out of them and our, later Irish speakers didn't really know who lived in them and they're often called Danes forts um, and this one is called Lisnabrini which means fort of the ferry hostel so people believe that fairies lived in them and they wouldn't go near them so for example Lisnagarvi which gives its name to Lisburn um, is fort of the gamblers because people would go there and gamble uh, because they'd be left alone. Um, so the Dalfeitach um, were a tribe that were pushed north and east by the O'Neills and they had their uh, capital at uh, Owen Macha. Uh, they lost that so they made a new capital at Patrick, and they extended as far as here and they then they battled the Dalnaratha, the other people of the Ullath Confederation which gave its name to Ulster at Belfast and eventually uh, they conquered them and moved over and one of their kings was called Matadan and uh, he gave his name to Ben Madigan which gives us a uh, cave hill of today. Con O'Neill was the last Gaelic lord of Upper Clannaboy. He died in 1619 and his name endures in the place names and the lore of East Belfast. His final resting place is near Moatlands, off the old Hollywood Road. So here we are in Moatlands, and this is called Moatlands because there was a Norman Mott here. And it was quite an escarpment um, uh, behind us, and uh, there was a Norman Mott which was levelled later. But also this became a graveyard, and there was a church here from about 1307 at least. And in this graveyard, Con O'Neill was buried. He wasn't buried where he wanted to be buried in Knock Graveyard. He was buried in this one in Ballymachan, which was less important. In fact, the church is believed to have been in ruins when he was buried. And um, what there is is a lot of waste ground. And uh, there aren't any gravestones. They were used to build the first moat house, which is just behind us here. Church is completely gone. It's probably buried under Finchley Park um, to our left here. But we still have an acre of ground, which is where Con was buried. And there's also a, a sort of a unionist myth about the area, that King Billy's troops uh, were here uh, on the way to the Battle of the Boyne and died over the winter, a lot of them died, and were buried here uh, in shallow graves. And so horses and cows wouldn't eat at the site after that. So for both reasons, uh, it was a graveyard uh, for both sides. Um, but today it's for sale. It's been zoned for Belfast City Council as uh, for housing development. So Con's going to be like Richard III in reverse. It's going to be concreted over. Hugh McCartan wrote a book called The Glamour of Belfast and he had this to say about Ballymachan here. Luckless Con O'Neill, last tannist of the yellow-haired clan, whose beginnings are lost in the darkness before the dawn of history, sleep lightly in your forgotten grave in Ballymachan, undisturbed by the thought that the grey castle is now but a grassy mound behind, beside a wall of ancient stones. Um, he won't sleep lightly here anymore when the bulldozers come. There's another little known graveyard in East Belfast. This is the Knox Cemetery. The wall was built here in about the 1850s, which was to deter um, grave robbers. And actually, you can actually see a lot of slabs uh, lying flat and I thought they were they'd actually fallen over. It turned out they were laid there to deter people from from getting at the graves. So um, quite interesting for a lot of historical reasons. Um, some of the people buried here include the Beers of Beersbridge and uh, there was um, a, a young uh, soldier in the First World War who was injured and he died in 1919 from his injuries. He returned and died a year later. Um, so for many reasons it's quite interesting and a lot of people I bring here haven't seen it before and they don't know it exists. But it is the holy hill of Column Kill, not Column Kill you. And Column Kill got knocked off the title so it just became knock after that. And it had a holy well and below us and the holy well was, uh, is now under Shandon Golf Club 
uh, because they filled it in, um, they were losing their balls, or either that or it's under the nocturnal carriageway, um, but it has vanished from view as well. So a holy Catholic past in East Belfast. Edmund McKenna was a Franciscan friar and he did a tour of Ulster in 1643, which is a bit of an odd thing to do because there was a rebellion in 1641 and would have been a bit dangerous for him uh, to come here. Uh, but he wrote uh, between Comer and the estuary Loch Lee, which flows by the towns of Carrick, Fergus and Belfast, is a church dedicated to St Columba, which Neil O'Neill, the chief of Tren Congal, endowed with many valuable lands and many privileges. And that is this uh, site here, which was a church of St Columkill, who is meant to have prayed on the way to Movilla Abbey to be trained by St Finian. Now his church, um, there are, there's nothing left of it except a high bank. And what we think is that the Anglican church, which took over this site, um, took away the stones from the church in order to make more room for graves. It became an Anglican graveyard. But in uh, Con O'Neill's time, this would have been his local church, and this would have been the place he would like to have been buried. Um, he, in a land agreement, uh, when he was selling a lot of land, um, he said he would like the patronage of the Kirk of Knock Holland Kilia, which is this holy hill of Knock. Um, so he obviously had a great interest in it. Um, but it was not to be, his final ignominy was to be buried elsewhere in somewhere less important. Now, it's very interesting historically. Um, it was closed a lot during the Troubles because it's so close to the REC headquarters. So it's in prime nick, it hasn't been vandalised. Um, also, it has a very high wall to deter um, grave robbers. One of the most compelling places in the Con O'Neill story is at the top of the church road, looking down over Belfast. This was the site of Con's castle. Okay, we're at the site of um, Castle Ray and Castle in Rewach, or the Grey Castle, which would have been a Norman house, uh, such as you find in the Kale, like um, Audley's Town, something like that. And it would have had four levels and turrets and would have a community around it and a wall around itself um, and a source of water down the hill. This was the capital of Upper Clandyboy, which was, uh, con which was a Gaelic um, lordship which controlled East Belfast and North Down. From here you could have seen Belfast Castle. Um, Belfast would have just had a castle and the chapel of the ford at the time, maybe a few huts around it and that sort of thing. And the, at the time of Con O'Neill, it was uh, controlled by the English. And there would have been, as someone put it, George Ben, a smothered animosity between the English and the Irish. But the English were trading with the Irish from here. They brought in things like wine, um, iron products, um, implements, and trade them for uh, Farm, uh, farm produce and things like that. So there was a sort of relationship. Although the English called Con's castle the eagle's nest, so obviously an eagle that had to be toppled from his perch. Um, the, there is no sign now of the castle. Um, in 1608, when Con was um, going badly, as they'd say, he'd lost a third of his, uh, two thirds of his land, and he had one third left, which he sold off. And in 1608, he sold off Castle Ray Castle. And he died in 1619. And he sort of wandered around the hills of Castle Ray um, between that and his death, um, a bit aimlessly, really. Uh, he sold it to Moses Hill, who did it up a bit and then let it fall apart because he took in more of an interest in Hillsborough and Hill Hall. Um, so it disappeared in the 1900s. And again, people would have taken stones from it to build houses and by the start of the 20th century it completely disappeared and nobody knew where it was. So in 1984, um, Castlereagh District Council decided to, or Border Council decided to have a look for it and they came up here and they got a dig up the hill uh, and along came Gladys Douglas, a local teacher from Lead Hill Primary School just down the road and she said to the archaeologists, you're looking in the wrong place and they said, look we know what we're doing and she said, well, I think you're looking in the wrong place. And she had the last laugh because they found nothing but a Caffrey's bottle. And she found uh, her site, which is just down here, 
was has now been accepted by Queen's archaeologists as the site of the castle and they're going to do a sonic scan here of the entire field and they hope to find the foundations of the castle if they do it'll be momentous for East Belfast history to find the site of Castle Castle So Con uh, really became a cropper because he fell out with the English. He was in the pay of the English during the Nine Years' War at the start of his reign, uh, but then he decided to rebel. And there are various stories of how he ended up in jail uh, during a rebellion or during a period when his soldiers uh, got in trouble with uh, soldiers at Belfast Castle, the English soldiers, and killed some of them, or killed one of them at any rate. Uh, uh, over a fight about wine but Con ended up in Carrickfergus jail uh, the capital of the English control in Ireland or in Northern Ireland and um, it's rumoured that Arthur Chichester wanted to hang him and grab his land so he decided to sign away half his land to Hugh Montgomery uh, if he helped him escape which he did and then came along another, another guy called James Hamilton who said to the king uh, don't give Con that Irishman half his land back, give him a third, give me another third. So his land was partitioned into thirds. And um, basically Con got the carried off area and East Belfast, which nobody wanted um, because it was sort of a, a swamp or um, heavily wooded. And it was called the domains of Castle Ray. And that's the bit that he kept. The coast, um, Bangor, Newtonards, North Down was all gone. Uh, and that's what began basically the, the beginning of the plantation of Ulster by Scots. And um, Con's irrelevance then, he sold the rest of his land. Um, he didn't make a very good country squire. And um, so George Benn, an historian of Belfast, put it in a great way. I'll, I'll read out a quote from him. It is curious to consider that in so short a space, the castle in which O'Neill had so long dwelt which had been looked upon with pride and confidence, should have utterly disappeared from the face of the earth. That the fir tree should grow on the hearthstone, and which he caroused with his trusty followers. That the lands which were stocked with his friends and vassals should now be inhabited by a race of people different in language, manners, customs, laws, names and religion. That the ground in which his bones and the bones of his father's rest should every year be disturbed by the rough hand of the careless rustic and that his very tombstone should be the threshold of a barn. <laughs>